Turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 11. 2 Corinthians chapter 11. Once you find that, you might turn over to 2 Peter chapter 1 for just a moment. 2 Peter chapter 1. It is interesting in this passage, after he talks about things we're to diligently add to our faith, he then says this, beginning in verse 11. He says, For so an entrance shall be ministered unto you abundantly into the everlasting kingdom of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Wherefore, I will not be negligent to put you always in remembrance of these things, though ye know them, and be established in the present truth. Yea, I think it meet, as long as I am in this tabernacle, to stir you up by putting you in remembrance, knowing that shortly I must put off this my tabernacle, even as the Lord Jesus Christ has showed me. Moreover, I will endeavor that you may be able, after my decease, to have these things always in your remembrance. Isn't that interesting that you've got three times in four verses? He's reminding these people that his job was to put them in remembrance of things that they already knew. You know, one of the things you discover about preaching is, and you've probably figured this out, I don't really preach any new things. I just keep bringing you in remembrance of things you already know. That is the job of the preacher, to keep bringing you into remembrance. You say, why is that? Well, part of it has to do with the deceitfulness of sin that will deceive us for a while if we're not careful. The Bible says in Hebrews chapter 3, verses 12 and 13, Take heed, brethren, lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief in departing from the living God. Exhort one another daily, while this called today, lest any of you be hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. There's not a person here who could not be hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. Plus, we all have the same heart trouble. And that's Jeremiah 17, 9. The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked who can know it. So we've got a heart that wants to deceive us. Sin will deceive us as we give in to it. We've got to be careful about that. But then we've also got an arch enemy. For he said at the end of 1 Peter chapter 5 and verse 8, Be sober, be vigilant, for your adversary, the devil, is a roaring lion, walketh about, seeking whom he may devour. He's after people. He's after your children, he's after your home, he's after you. He wants to devour you if he can. Now, if you're saved, he cannot get your soul, but if he can get your testimony, then at least he'll keep you from being effective in bringing others to the Son of God. He knows his time is short. He's even busier now than what he was back when the Scripture was written because his time is so much even shorter right now. Now, thank God we can have the victory in him. I've said many times, the only thing that really changes are the faces. Now, you say, well, is that a slap? No, that's what the Bible teaches. Because we're going to be dealing with the same things over and over and over again. That's why the scripture is complete. He wrote about everything need to be wrote about. He gave us the answer for everything that we would face. It's all right here. He told the Corinthians in 2 Corinthians chapter 1 and or chapter 2 and verse 11... He says, we are not ignorant of his devices. He's not invented new devices to catch us. And he's warned us about the devil. And this warning has not changed, as I had you turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 11. I want you to notice, beginning in verse 2. For I am jealous over you with godly jealousy. For I have espoused you to one husband, that I may present you as a chaste virgin to Christ. But I fear lest by any means as the serpent beguiled Eve through his subtlety. So your mind should be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. For if he that cometh preacheth another Jesus, whom we have not preached, or if we receive, ye receive another spirit which ye have not received, or another gospel which ye have not accepted, ye might well bear with him. For I suppose I was not a whit behind the very chiefest of the apostles, but though I be rude in speech, yet not in knowledge, but we have been truly made manifest among you in all things. Now go on down to verse 13. 
He says, for such are false apostles, deceitful workers, transforming themselves into the apostles of Christ. And no marvel, for Satan himself is transformed into an angel of light. Therefore, it is no great thing if his ministers also be transformed as the ministers of righteousness, whose end shall be according to their works. I want to talk tonight about when the devil puts on his best dress suit. Let's pray. Father, we come to you in the name of the Lord Jesus. And I pray, Heavenly Father, tonight you give us some warnings that we'd take heed to. For truly, in all this time, this ministry has been here now for 26 years. And Father, in all this time, we know that our enemy has not stopped working. He continually wants to destroy the people of this place. He wants to destroy the testimony of this place. He wants to destroy the homes of this place. He wants to destroy the witness and the fervor and the fervency of this place. And you warned us about that. So, Father, I pray tonight that we take your warning seriously and understand that we are fighting a real enemy. And, Lord, we'll thank you for what you do in every heart and in every life. For we ask it all in Jesus' name. Amen. You understand that the devil is real. He's real. Now, he's not omnipresent. He is not omniscient. Those are attributes that only belong to God. But he is powerful and he is wise. He's slick. He knows the weaknesses of mankind and he plays on those weaknesses. He doesn't come in a red suit with a pitchfork and a tail. The Bible says he has transformed himself into an angel of light. Many times he looks very good. Many times he looks on the outside as good as those who are truly ministers of light, those who do know the Lord Jesus and those who do preach the true gospel of Jesus Christ. How in the world are we going to be able to tell the difference? You understand, the devil is not a cartoon character. He is not playing the Bible says, Jesus said in John chapter 10 and verse 10, The thief cometh not but for to steal and to kill and to destroy. But I am come that they might have life and that they might have it more abundantly. The devil is not the catch-all for anything we perceive as bad. He is not now in hell. Now he's going to be locked up. One of the things that will make the millennium so wonderful is Satan will be locked up for a thousand years. And then he'll be loose for a short season, only, of course, to be thrown in the pit of the lake of fire and brimstone that was prepared for him and his angels. And then he will be seen no more. Hallelujah. He's going to get his. The worst enemies that a nation can have are not those who wear opposing uniforms, but those who look like good citizens but are traitors. They are so effective in doing great harm to a country. And they learn all this from the devil. That's what he does. That's why, by the way, when you take even a soul-winning church, the devil is going to be active at sowing tares among the wheat. Now listen, I believe in being doctrinally sound. I believe in being clear with my presentation. But you understand that there is, go there is a devil who is going to sow tares among the wheat. You take the most doctrinal sound place in the world, there are going to be tares among the wheat. And you don't always know who they are because many times they look just like the wheat. Sometimes they even look perhaps a little bit better than the wheat. But he's done his worst damage by dressing up and looking good. Paul warned the Ephesian elders in Acts chapter 20 and verse 29, For I know this, that after my departing shall grievous wolves enter in among you, not sparing the flock. Notice what he says. Also of your own selves shall men arise speaking perverse things to draw away disciples after them. When Jesus talked about false prophets in the Sermon on the Mount, he let us know that by their fruits ye shall know them. You can't always tell them 
by how they look, but he says, by their fruits ye shall know them. So I want you to notice some things, some lessons that we get from the passage that we read tonight that will help us to discern what's good, what's evil. That's why he's written the book, to teach us. Notice some things. First of all, he, com he complicates the devil. He says in verse 13, For such are false prophets, deceitful workers, transforming themselves into the apostles of Christ. As a matter of fact, you back up just a little bit to verse 3, and he says, But I fear, lest by any means, as the serpent beguiled Eve through his subtlety, so your mind should be corrupted. Now get this, from the simplicity that is in Christ. The gospel is not difficult. Do you get that? The gospel is not difficult. Now if there's any place that ought to be firm on knowing what the gospel is, it ought to be this place. I mention it a lot. Why? It's foundational. It's key. You don't have the gospel, right? You've missed everything. If you don't have the gospel, right, then how can you even be saved? You've got to have the gospel, right? You've got to know what it is. Paul said in Romans 1, 16, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth and to the Jew first and also the Greek. But let's go back again. We've done this many times. We did it with the ordination last week. Mentioned it again. But go back to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. If it can get you grounded. You see, it's not, it's not a bad thing or a hard thing to put God's people in remembrance of this truth. Notice he says in verse 1, Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel which I preached unto you, which also ye have received, wherein ye stand. You notice that term, the gospel. He says, I declare unto you the gospel which I preached, past tense, by which also, verse 2, ye are saved. Look at verse 3. For I delivered unto you, past tense, here's what he preached. I delivered unto you, first of all, that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins, according to the Scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day, according to the Scriptures. Now that's the gospel. Our sin debt has been paid. The wages of sin is death. Christ died. He didn't deserve to die himself, for he was sinless. But on the cross of Calvary, our sin was placed on Him. He paid our sin debt so we wouldn't have to die that second death. He was buried and three days later He rose up from the dead. Romans 4.25, He was delivered for our offenses. He was raised again for our justification. So then how do you get saved? Well, the Bible lets us know part of the makeup of it. Ephesians 2.8.9, For by grace are you saved through faith. That not of yourselves, it's a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. You can't pay for one of your sins. Christ already paid for all of them. You do not deserve to get saved. Nobody deserves salvation. That's why it is by grace and it is appropriated by faith when you put your trust in Jesus Christ. That verse I quoted a moment ago, Romans 1, 16, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. For it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. Matter of fact, in Acts 2, 20, or 20 and verse 21, he makes this statement, testifying both to the Jews and also to the Greeks, repentance toward God and faith toward our Lord Jesus Christ. You go over to the book of uh, Hebrews a moment, turn over there, turn to Hebrews chapter 6. After rebuking these people, need, needing to be taught the milk of the Word again, he lets us know what the milk of the Word is, what those first things are, such important things. Notice what he says, beginning in verse 1. <coughs> Therefore, leaving the principles of the doctrine of Christ. You've got to believe right about Jesus. That, by the way, is the reason the book of John was written. John chapter 20, verses 30 and 31. Many other signs truly did Jesus in the presence of, these, of his disciples which are not written in this book, but these are written that you might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you might have life through His name. See, first of all, you've got to believe right about Jesus. If you don't believe in the right Jesus, then you've missed the gospel. You say, I thought it was His death, burial, and resurrection. Yeah, but which Jesus? You realize we've got a couple of people named Jesus that attend Madison Baptist Church. You understand that? 
What Jesus are you believing in? Are you believing on the Jesus who is God, the Jesus who is eternal, the Jesus who is all-powerful, the Jesus who is God Himself, who took upon Himself flesh to pay our sin debt? That is the only Jesus that saves. He's it. That's why Acts 4.12, Neither is there salvation in any other, for there's none other name under heaven given among men, whereby we must be saved. Talked about the, the doctrine of Christ. Then he goes on. Let us go on into perfection, not laying again the foundation. This is foundational. Notice, not laying again the foundation of repentance from dead works and of faith toward God, of the doctrine of baptisms and of laying of hands and the resurrection of the dead and of eternal judgment. And this we do if God permit. He said, now, now that's foundational for every believer, those things. After all, once you get saved, once you trust Christ as Savior, what's the next thing you're commanded to do? Not for salvation, but the next thing you're commanded to do after you get saved, you get baptized. He said, we need to go on beyond that. We are talking about getting into the meat of the Word, but these people have gotten so backslidden they've gotten away from it. Now, false teachers add works or law to the, to the grace of God. Of course, once they do that, it's no longer grace. Romans chapter 11 and verse 6, If it be of grace, and is it no more of works, otherwise grace is no more grace. And if it be of works, and is it no more grace, otherwise work is no more work. Salvation is by grace through faith. Keep your hand here in 2 Corinthians and turn over for a moment to Galatians chapter 2. Galatians chapter 2. Notice the clarity that's here. The Apostle Paul is writing, he says, knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but by the faith of Jesus Christ. Even we have believed in Jesus Christ that we might be justified by the faith of Christ, not by the works of the law, for by the works of the law shall no flesh be justified. Go down to verse 21. I do not frustrate the grace of God, for if righteousness come by the law, then Christ is dead in vain. Now, to give you the background of this book, the Apostle Paul had gone into this area, won many to Christ. But after he left the area, some people we know as Judaizers came in and they said, you trusted Jesus, that's fine, but that's not enough. You've got to keep the law. You've got to be circumcised in order to stay saved. He's writing to refute them and to rebuke them and to rebuke the Galatians for even listening to these people. So you get to chapter 3. He says, oh, foolish Galatians. Who hath bewitched you that ye should not obey the truth, before whose eyes Jesus Christ hath been evidently set forth, crucified among you? This only would I have learned of you. Received ye the Spirit by the works of the law, or by the hearing of faith? What's the obvious answer to that question? By the hearing of faith. So then he says, Are you so foolish, having begun in the Spirit, are ye now made perfect by the flesh? You were saved by grace through faith. By the way, you stay saved by grace through faith. You can't keep yourself saved. He's the one who does that. Jude 24. Now unto him that is able to keep you from falling and present you faultless in the presence of his glory with exceeding joy. Man, we have to have that down. So number one, he tries he, to complicate the gospel. Secondly, he contradicts the message of the cross back here. In 2 Corinthians chapter 11, notice verse 14, uh, verse 13, For such are false, uh, such false apostles, deceitful workers, transforming themselves into the apostles of Christ. And no marvel, for Satan himself is transformed into an angel of light. Therefore it is no great thing if his ministers be also transformed as the ministers of righteousness, whose end shall be according to their works." Down in verse 4, after talking about the simplicity of Christ. For if he that cometh preacheth another Jesus, and we have not preached, uh, preached, or if he receive another spirit, which ye have not received, or another gospel, which ye have not accepted, ye might well bear with them. The devil hates the message of the cross. Evidently, he even deceived Peter about the cross for a moment or two. Go back to the book of Matthew, chapter 16. Matthew chapter 16. Now, Jesus answered correctly. I'm sorry, Peter answered correctly about who Jesus was. He said, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God, and Jesus commends him for that. But then you get to verse 21. From that time forth began Jesus to show unto his disciples that how that he must go unto Jerusalem, 
suffer many things of the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and be raised again the third day. Then Peter took him, began to rebuke him, saying, Be it far from thee, Lord, this shall not be unto thee. But he turned and said unto Peter, Get thee behind me. Who? Was Peter Satan? Is that what he's saying? Now he does call Judas Iscariot the son of perdition, which he was. Here he calls Peter Satan. Is he the devil? No, he wasn't the devil. But who was he sounding like? The devil. You see, the devil didn't want the cross. Did all he could to prevent the cross. Because that cross would be where our sin debt would be paid. That's why in the book of Revelation you have the picture when Israel's about to give birth to the promised child. You have uh, the dragon waiting to devour the child. The reason Herod, uh, Satan led Herod to destroy all the babies in Bethlehem two years of age and under was because he was trying to get them before the cross. He didn't want the cross. Matter of fact, you go back to second, our 1 Corinthians chapter 2. And notice what the Apostle Paul says beginning in verse 1 about his testimony when he first went to them. He said, And I, brethren, when I came to you, came not with excellency of speech or of wisdom, declaring unto you the testimony of God. For I determined not to know anything among you save Jesus Christ and Him crucified. And I was with you in weakness and in fear and in much trembling. And my speech and my preaching was not with enticing words of man's wisdom, but in demonstration of the Spirit and of power, that your faith should not stand in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. Howbeit we speak wisdom among them that are perfect, yet not the wisdom of this world, nor of the princes of this world that come to naught, but we speak the wisdom of God in a mystery, even the hidden wisdom which God ordained before the world unto our glory. You go back again, go back to chapter 1. And notice how the Apostle Paul puts this. He says, for instance, in verse, six, uh, verse 17, For Christ sent me not to baptize, but to preach the gospel, not with wisdom of words, lest the cross of Christ should be made of none effect. For the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness. But unto us which are saved, it is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise, will bring to nothing the understanding of the prudent. Notice down in verse 21. For after that in the wisdom of God, the world by wisdom knew not God. It pleased God by the foolishness of preaching to save them that believe. Now I know we have a tendency to get all enamored by the smooth talkers, the smooth speakers that make everything sound good, that will even make you feel good. But the message is the message of the cross. It's not a matter of being smooth. It's a, not a matter of cool illustrations. It's a matter of simply preaching the truth. And with what God calls, He calls different types of men. He calls men, some who, who are like Apollos, and then you've got some like Paul who are slow of speech. The truth is God's people ought to be able to receive all of God's message from the Word of God where the emphasis is on the Word of God and the work of God not on the smoothness of the preacher. Lest we get like the Corinthians and become preacher followers. There's a real danger there. You see, there are really only two religions. Satan says, do this and live. Christ says, it's done. Believe and live. When the Philippian jailer fell down before Paul and Silas and said, What must I do to be saved? Their answer was clear. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. Can't get much plainer than that. The Ethiopian eunuch said to Philip, said, Well, what doth hinder me to be baptized? He said, If thou believest with all thine heart, thou mayest. He said, I believe that Jesus is the Son of God. And they went down into the water and he baptized them there. Why? Because he simply did what the Scripture said to do. To many, the cross seems too violent, too bloody. It offends. But it took someone else's blood to take care of your sin and my sin. And without the shedding of blood, there is no remission. I remember going to the hospital. Uh, somebody in the church had asked me to visit a lady who was going to have surgery. And so I went in to talk to her. Surgery was coming up. I just began to talk to her about Jesus 
And I said, you know, I thank God for the blood of Christ. And she went, ooh, blood. She said, I don't like to hear that. And I said, well, man, without the shedding of blood, there is no remission. He had to shed his blood in order for you to get forgiven. Without his blood, there is no hope. So he contradicts the message of Christ. Not only that, he causes controversy among the believers. How does he do that? Well, no marvel, for Satan himself is transformed into an angel of light. Satan's workers appear to be righteous. Many who cause trouble in churches sound so right. And boy, the bitterness and strife that takes place, according to James chapter 3, verses 14 through 16, they're of the devil. Matter of fact, it is a sign of carnality among believers. Keep your hand here. I could quote this passage for you, but I want you to look at it yourself. Go over to 1 Corinthians chapter 3. He says, And I, brethren, could not speak unto you as unto carnal. I mean as unto spiritual, but as unto carnal, even as unto babes in Christ. I have fed you with milk and not with meat, for hitherto ye were not able to bear it, neither yet now are ye able. For ye are yet carnal. For whereas there is among you envyings and strife and divisions, are ye not carnal and walk as men? As a matter of fact, in the passage he says, For one saith, I am of Paul, another I am of Paulus, are ye not carnal? In other words, our identity is not found in the preachers that we've heard. It's found in the Christ who saved us. In Acts chapter 15, Paul and the believers from Jerusalem the Bible says when those so-called believers from Jerusalem came by and they preached that you had to be circumcised in order to stay saved and keep the law, the Bible says there was no small disputation and contention. These people were part of the church. And what they said sounded good. And they accused Paul. Paul's having fellowship. Uh, he's trying to teach them that they don't have to keep the law of Moses. And boy, some preachers, they enjoyed hearing that. So they began to accuse Paul too, and even James got wrapped up in the rumors that were floating about Paul. James is the one who told Paul to go to the temple in chapter 20 and to give, bring a vow because he listened to the rumors that he heard. Man, you know the devil is having a heyday in that church, listening to false doctrine, listening to the accusation of the brethren. He's the accuser of the brethren, seeking to lift up himself and cause trouble for God's people. Right now, right, I mean, there are so many different controversies out there in fundamentalism scares me to death sometimes. But then, if fundamentalism is truth and it clings to the truth, don't you know the devil's going to put tares in among it to tear it up? Don't you know that? That is a sign, by the way, that there must be truth there for him to be doing all that he can to tear it up. One of, one of the big controversies right now among independent Baptists is a thing called double inspiration, which I never even heard till about two years ago, double inspiration of the Scripture or the preservation of the Scripture. We believe that God inspired the Bible. Amen. Amen. And that He preserved it for us in the English language. Now, here's the funny thing about this. This group that says we... but No, the Bible is double inspired. It was inspired in the original language and God inspired it in the English. That means that they believe every word of our English translation is from God. What about the preservationists? We believe that God inspired the Bible in the original languages and He preserved every word of it in the English. Both groups believe all that's the Word of God. And they're attacking one another. They're slamming one another. One group saying of the other group, well, they don't even believe the Bible. Both groups believe the Bible. Back when I went to Bible college, of course, one of the things I was taught in Bible college was we believe in the verbal plenary inspiration of the Scripture. Verbal means the words. Jesus said, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. Plenary means all of it. But then they would say, we don't believe in mechanical dictation because... God used the personalities of these men in what they wrote. But then I read verses like 2 Peter chapter 1 and verse 21, and it says, Holy men of God spake as they were moved 
by the Holy Ghost. They could not write down one word of their own. All of it came as God had already settled it in heaven. Now, here's the thing about that group and my group with the mechanical dictation. They believed every word of the Bible was inspired. I believe every word of the Bible is inspired. I may disagree with them on the method, but the final result of both was exactly the same. Why on earth would we attack one another? That's the devil. That's what the devil does. You know what I found in a lot of theological discussions that I've had with people over the years? We actually agreed we believed the same thing. We just came at it from different angles. Do you find that out, Brother Wagner? So we attack everybody who doesn't say it exactly like we say it. Even though we believe exactly the same thing. What on earth is wrong with us? We've got a Bible. We're not ignorant of the devil's devices. What is wrong with us to not pay attention to what's going on? The devil's busy. We need to be fighting him, not joining in with him. He is the accuser of the brethren. Who art thou that judgest another man's servant? To his own master he standeth or falleth. Good grief. You know what? I am not going to have an Easter egg hunt for our bus routes. Never had one, not going to have one. Now, wait a second. And I, and I appreciate you who agree with me. That's a wonderful thing. I always like it when a few people agree with me. It's nice to have a few people right. But I know of some pastors who love souls who also want to reach people just like we want to reach people. And they do have an Easter egg hunt for their kids because they know it'll get some lost kids out that hadn't heard the gospel. Now, I wouldn't do it. They do it. I'm not going to slam them. I'm not going to write about them. Bless God, if they're wrong, they'll answer to God for it. And wouldn't, I be, wouldn't that be something if I got to heaven and found out, well, I am getting to heaven, by the way. That, that's already settled. But to get to heaven, Jesus says, why didn't you have an Easter egg hunt? <laughs> this kid would have come, that kid would have come. Hey! Now, I may disagree with the method of what they're doing. Okay, and if I get together with them, I'll talk to them about it. But man, I'm for them winning souls. I'm for them reaching people with the gospel of Christ. Yeah, you know, I'm not a big guy on bumper stickers. Now, when I got saved, I mean... You understand, I came out of just a totally godless background. When I got saved, we bought bumper stickers. Man, we put them on the car. We gave them away to people. Things go better with Jesus. You know, that type of stuff. The Jesus generation. I mean, you know, that uh, the give Jesus, let him be the master card of your life and all that kind of... I, man, I was, I was just excited about Jesus. Well, can't you love people that are excited about Jesus? They've been saying, well, I'm mature, I wouldn't do that. Well, fine, you're mature now. When they get mature, they probably won't do it either. But give them a break. Then you got the super spiritual, you know. Somebody comes in and they say something like this. They say, well, you know, let me just use Brother Thad here. They say, well, Brother Thad saved me. What do you mean, Brother Thad saved you? He didn't save you. Jesus saved you if you're saved. And yet the Apostle Paul said, I am become all things to all men that by all means I might save some. We get more concerned about the wording than Jesus does. Than the Holy Spirit did. We better be careful about that. Man, we are so willing. I mean, the accuser of the brethren is sitting there saying, Hey, buddy, I've got some allies here working for me. And in every case, they're standing for truth. By the way, I won't have Santa Claus here either. Not going to do it. But I know men who love souls, who have a Santa Claus thing for their bus ministry. Do I think they're wrong? Yeah, but I'm not going to spend my time slamming them. The Apostle Paul didn't even do that in Philippians chapter 1 when there were some people who were preaching simply to add to his bonds in jail. And he said, I thank God that Christ is preached. And then he says of himself, he says, My earnest expectation, my hope that nothing I should be ashamed, but in everything, everything, that he gets the glory. That ought to be our desire. Now, meanwhile, we need to do right as we allow the Spirit of God to guide us. And, as, and the Spirit of God and the Word of God. 
But there's always going to be some differences. We've got to be careful lest we end up slamming everybody. Everybody. I don't need that kind of a ministry. We don't want that kind of a ministry. We want a ministry based on Jesus Christ as revealed in the Word of God. We've got an enemy. And he will transform himself into an angel of light. He's done that. He is the accuser of the brethren. We need to understand that sometimes better isn't better. You say, what do you mean, preacher? Well, we're looking for all the new stuff all the time, all the new gadgets. Well, sometimes maybe we just need to stay away from some of the new gadgets. You know, (laughs) I think a lot of times those new gadgets... Just give us excuses not to do the work that we've been called to do. Don't misunderstand me. I'm forgetting the gospel out on the Internet. I'm forgetting the gospel out on the TV. Forgetting the gospel out on the radio. I'm forgetting the gospel out through the printed ministry. All the, I'm forgetting the gospel out in those ways. But that cannot be a substitute to going out and knocking on doors. To meeting people face to face and saying, I'd like to share with you about Jesus Christ. That's what we've been called to do. That's God's command. And these other things can't be a substitute for that. They're good to do. Nothing wrong with doing those things. But we need to stay true to obeying the Word of God. A little testimony here about Madison Baptist Church. You go back to when we were in the other building. How many you are here tonight and you were never in the other building as Madison Baptist Church? Would you raise your hand? we got a few people like that here. So you really don't know what we're talking about in that building. We were in it for a number of years. We thank God for that building. It was a tool. But when it got to be summertime, buddy, it was tough. When it got to be 95 degrees and muggy outside, it was 85 degrees and muggy inside, and we could not get it any cooler than that. We had two five-ton air conditioners. We ended up adding a third air conditioner. That's all we could add. That still wouldn't make it decent on Sunday evening. Matter of fact, I remember when Brother Nall gave us the idea of putting uh, hoses on the roof. We put hoses on the roof, put holes in the hose, and during the Sunday evening service, we had water draining on the roof to try And it cooled it down about 10 degrees. It didn't get it down to where it's cool like it is here now. But we were over there, we had, I think, 83 parking lots, our parking lots, parking spaces, not 83 parking lots, we had about 83 parking spaces. We wanted to expand the parking lot, but we found out from the city that we could only add three without coming under a whole new set of regulations. That whole new set of regulations would require us to put islands in, and if we put the islands in, by the time we did that, we would only be adding the three and using up the rest of our parking lot. The grass is where everybody else had been parking. They had been doing that even when it rained, walking in the mud, all of that. And if you remember there, we didn't have any place where you could drop your family off without them getting wet. We've got two places here. That sun on Sunday evening, especially in the summertime, beat right on that back door. And boy, that was hot in itself. And then when it rained, it was nice for the sun not to be beating there, but, man, everybody just came in soaked. And then when you got inside, we were jam-packed. We had people sitting in side rooms where they had a, a, you know, a bar coming down, one of the posts coming down, and they couldn't even see the whole platform. But people did it. People sat in close together. They gave up their seats to sit in one of the side rooms, pay attention to the service. They did, that was good. That was good. And by the way, the bathroom situation was horrible. You To go to the bathroom, behind us, you went through a door on either side of the platform. There was a boy's bathroom and a girl's bathroom on each side, and each of them only had one commode. We're jam-packed. I mean, we were running about 300 and some on Sunday night. You got four commodes, that's it. And the hallway was like that. It, but we did it, and we had a great time. It was wonderful. And then God gave us this building. Now nobody has to park on the grass. Nobody has to walk through the mud. When it rains, you can drop your family off underneath the overhang. You can even do it when it's sunny outside. It doesn't make any difference. 
You got a lot of different ways to get in here, and we got more bathrooms than we can use. We have it really nice. We've got air conditioning. It was hot when you came in, but you noticed we turned it down. And that cooled you off, didn't it? We couldn't do that over in the other building. You can spread out a little bit, and since some of us have gotten a little bigger, that's very important to us now. But here's the danger. We've gotten satisfied. Matter of fact, we've gotten to the place we're not just satisfied. We don't want anybody to take away our comfort. I mean, I know where my seat is. I don't want anybody taking away my seat. And we're going to sit down. Somebody comes in and needs a seat. We just want to make sure we look busy so that they don't try to put them in here. That wasn't the way it was over there. Over there, people would get up and move so that some visitor could have a seat. They, they were con- we were concerned about souls then, even when they came into church. I don't know how many times I heard Mass friend of these church I've ever been in. People shake their hands. We come in and hunker down. We're comfortable now. That's not good. What happened? Did the building do that to us? Or do we have an enemy who said, you know, a church is awful busy. They got a good-sized building out there now. Now let's see what I can do to just calm them down. You get calm for a while, and it won't be long. Then you start complaining. And you start complaining about the very things that you have now that are great that you didn't used to have, and it didn't bother you a whole lot. We have an enemy. But our mission has not changed one bit. Remember, Peter's telling his people, he says, listen, uh, this doesn't bother me to bring you in remembrance of this. This is what I do. We need to understand this. By the way, something else the devil will do. He'll cast doubts on the Word of God. Is it a big deal? This matter of short hair and long hair, whether or not a man has long hair and a woman has short hair, well, God uses 15 verses to explain it in 1 Corinthians chapter 11. It's a big enough deal to God in the New Testament to put 15 verses in there to tell you why it's to be that way. He even lets us know that it has to do with when you pray to God, when you are talking to God. It matters whether or not the man's head is uncovered and the woman's is covered. It matters. He even says in one point, because of the angels. Doesn't even take time to explain it. But that ought to be enough for us, us, the very fact God says it. And yet there are people who claim to believe the Bible who will gripe and complain about a preacher preaching on hair. And yet God gives a whole passage on it. Where does that griping come from? Ah, from our enemy. From our enemy. That's why you could go to a lot of churches tonight. And it's the men who have the long hair. It's the women who have the short hair. Exactly the opposite of what Jesus says. And so they'll put those men up on their stage with their guitars. And they'll rock the night away to get you ready for the message that isn't going to say anything. A cotton candy message that will make you feel good about yourself. And people leave happy because they've left all the old truths, live openly contrary to the clear teaching of the Word of God. And you know what? That same thing could happen here. Back in the 1970s, I went to Tennessee Temple. At that time, it was one of the fundamental schools. Not the only one. It was one of several fundamental schools. They ran over 10,000 in Sunday school at that time. That's where I learned about standards. I learned about it there. I heard men like Lester Roloff. Man, I heard men like John O'Rice. I heard some of the great preachers of the day who came in and, man, put your heart committed to the Word of God. You're not going to get that if you go there today. You go there today and they're just as likely to have a big rock bash for the young people. They do that every semester to welcome the incoming uh, freshmen and those incoming freshmen are greeted with a band that looks everything like the hippie bands that I did the, the, uh, the concerts for when I was a rock and roll disc jockey. They look like them, they smell like them, they sound like them. But that wouldn't have happened at Tennessee Temple back in the 1970s. Happens there now. By the way, it'll happen here. We get to listen to the devil with his new ideas, 
get away from the straight teaching of the Word of God and just say, well, you know, people need something a little lighter. That sounds to me like Aaron. When the people came to him and said, we don't know what happened to Moses. Up, make us gods. Oh, okay. And when Moses comes down the mountain, he's angry. He said, you know the people. They're bent on mischief. You need to give in to the people. No, we need to stand firm on God and show God's people God's way. When we get committed to the truth of this book, then we can recognize the evil one and his wiles. We are not ignorant of his devices. Let's not get lulled to sleep. Let's realize we are more responsible to God today than ever in the history of Madison Baptist Church to obey his word and reach the lost. More responsible today. Let's do it. Let's pray. Father, we come to you in the name of the Lord Jesus. Thank you for this time together time of admonition, a time simply of bringing into remembrance things that we already know. Now, Heavenly Father, please help us to stand for your truth. Dear God, deal with our hearts, deal with our attitudes, deal, Heavenly Father, with our conviction and our life. Have your way, Father, in our midst. If there's one here without Christ, may they understand there is only one gospel that saves. And may they come to Jesus Christ and be born again. He is their only hope. Father, we pray for Christians today. Lord, some have slacked off. I pray they decide they're going to get busy. They realize our responsibility hasn't gotten less, it's gotten greater. To whom much is given, much shall be required. And you truly have given us much here. Help us to be our best for you, for we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.